sure we were wrong and we were going to make a mess of the whole movement if we kept up. <laughs> Anybody remember that? Yeah. Yeah. So, the enactment of this initiative calls for an amnesty and a clearing of all criminal records for all people ever convicted of any type. By the way, you can grow as much pot as you want in Alaska, whether it's for industrial use, medicinal <laughs> use, this law will out unlimited. There's not going to be three pounds or five pounds of the government coming back in and inspecting it. And um, finally, in the uh, amnesty, it clears all criminal records, everybody in jail, parole, probation, um, wait, awaiting trial for anything to do with marijuana is free and clear. The records are sealed. There is no more criminal record of him on the ballot. <laughs> When I go up and start educating people, I'll tell you, most of them say, I, I can't believe that, and then you show them the facts, you show them truth. Most people, about 80% of people, are really, really honest. And finally, the last thing is with, a, I just want to read this one part. Within 120 days following the effective date of this initiative, the legislature shall get together and they shall appoint two people will be appointed from the attorney general, two from the governor, two from the lieutenant governor, two from the speaker of the house, two appointed from the president pro tem of the senate, and the remaining six to be chosen from the private sector of the legislature and the house of representatives. So they're all government people appointed, all government appointees, and their job is to look in, and this is the only part that calls for, for any... Uh, reimbursement to people. There's no part that is law that calls for reimbursement. All it says, it calls for them to investigate whether the government did anything wrong, whether the government lied, whether the government kept information away from the public, and then that they're to make recommendations, possibly to be followed, not to be law. That, and there's, they, they don't have any effect in law, but they have the effect of reporting whether the people deserve to be, now they're let out of jail after seven years, maybe they should get an education paid for by the state, or maybe they should uh, get some sort of reimbursement to get their lives back in, or their homes were taken away, and, was, and subsequently we find out it was done in a, in a way that was high, highly immoral or illegal for the government to act in such a way. And we maybe will find a way to recompensate these people for what they have lost. It is not a law, it's a suggestion. And we ask the government people themselves, the appointees of the governor and the attorney general, to make up this thing and see if they come to any conclusion that maybe some of us who are in jail deserve to get some reimbursement for that. And I'll tell you, if you stay in with veracity, with all of our energy, we can win this battle in Alaska. This is 45% going in is on our side. So it's not like some mountain to climb. Alaska, Alaska is the one state we could probably get it done with. You can't speak to 33 million Californians very easily unless you got a lot of money. But we plan to be in every city, in every place, in Alaska, over and over, redundantly, in every Eskimo village, from every place where we rent a plane, we're going to fly in, we're going to go into every one of these villages, we're going to show them the movies, we're going to show them the information, we're going to show them that 50% of Alaskans have to be alcoholics by 12 years old. They're mainly drug and problem. I'll tell you, they're willing to support this. They are willing to come out of the closet on this because they already have come halfway out of the closet. They can grow marijuana legally there. Thank
Good evening, this is Patrick Moore. Welcome to Louisville Late Night. <laughs> this evening we're at the uh, National Normal Conference in Washington, D.C., and we're privileged to have with us here a great leader in the uh, decriminalization of hemp and uh, in, indirectly a uh, facilitator of health care, an attorney who's very active bringing a uh, potent and relatively non-toxic uh, medicine to uh, millions of Americans potentially and also someone who has a great deal of our environmental concern and sensitivity and someone who on his own has become nationally and, rec and internationally recognized as a mover and a shaker and a fearless courageous warrior on the de decriminalization of hemp and the knowledge of just what hemp is and, and how hemp can save the world. I want to introduce to you Mr. Don Worchefter. <coughs> Don, Hello, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Also, uh, tell us a little bit about the Ohio Hempery and, and uh, if you would, how you came to be affiliated with that organization. Well, in my small town law practice, I kept getting these grower cases people caught with marijuana and even people caught with just seeds of marijuana and looking into those cases I saw that the uh, seeds were also available in any pet food store 5 and 10 wherever as a bird food so the question of why those were legal but others weren't came up and so in my research of that I discovered the hemp industry in the old days the hemp industry was a major part of our uh, culture. While Louisville was one of the epicenters of the hemp industry, for almost a hundred years the hemp was farmed there and shipped out of Louisville. Farmington, that estate there southeast of Louisville, was one big hemp plantation, as were many, many other farms in that region. You're saying that hemp has a, I mean Louisville has a uh, pivotal role in the history of uh, hemp in the United States? Oh yeah. Uh, the whole state of Kentucky, hemp was the predominant cash crop for over a hundred years running. So uh, it, it was, you know, defined as part of the major history of Kentucky, and we barely remember that in time. Yeah, Kentucky just got a hemp bill passed. Uh, it allows for a study of hemp. That's a step in the right direction. I think the representatives and the senators that passed it are just wanting to go home and see if they get their heads chewed off for a, were, such a sensible measure. And were you involved in that? Oh. In the initiative in, in Kentucky? Oh, in the early days, but it took six years to get any kind of fair hearing about hemp in Kentucky. It was... Uh, Did you work with Gatewood Galbraith at all? Oh, Gatewood's a good, good buddy of mine for a long uh -huh. time. But you're both, uh, you're both I, attorneys, too. Yeah. Yeah, there was a whole host of people that pulled together this coalition that got the Kentucky Hemp Bill passed, and for anybody who helped in that, I thank you. And uh, Don, where in Ohio were you saying the small town where you're? I live in Athens County, Ohio. We run the Ohio Hemp. It's one eight hundred buy hemp. Call for a catalog. And is there a website? It's a uh, hempery dot com. I also would ask people to look at the Hemp Industries Association website, which is hempindustries.com, or a uh, favorite site of mine is ecolution.com, E-C-O-L-U-T-I-O-N.com, and uh, oh, many others. Would you tell us about the Ohio Hempery a little bit more? I mean, what is the Ohio Hempery? What, I mean, do you make clothes, or uh, does this have something to do with marijuana? Or We started, or what, what, in 1989 making hemp products. We started with hemp paper. that. We printed on with hemp oil ink. We got into twines and ropes and then cloth and clothing and then hemp seed oil and all the things you can make from hemp seed oil. And finally, nowadays that we can grow in Canada, we're into hemp foods. And that's the most fun aspect of hemp as far as I'm concerned. Really, I mean, 